I want to introduce Michelle Emanuel. She's one of the most amazing women I've ever met. <laughs> did I meet you two years ago too? I did. No. No? Oh, we met, oh, we actually, we were separated at birth, I forgot. <laughs> and so we've known each other for a really, really long time. Uh, we are of like mind and we met on the internet actually. <laughs> We, we were reacquainted on the, on the internet. Uh, Michelle's a brainiac. She knows everything about any subject she presents, including this one, the polyvagal theory, and how it applies to the way we as practitioners and the way we as parents and caregivers interact with our infants and what it all means. And I'm super excited that you're here, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came into the polyvagal theory, and I spent um, eight and a half years working in a NICU. So it was around um, 1998 that I started wondering. I was working as an occupational therapist in a NICU. I was starting to wonder, like, what was going on with these babies with suck, swallow, breathe coordination, and and I was sort of responsible in the nursery for how some of the feeding went with the babies, premature babies who are now at term age or. At, at the ready time for working on PO feeding. And so I started looking into the research and I stumbled across you know, this guy named Steve Porges who was putting out this theory, the polyvagal theory, about how sex ball breathe coordination is integrated with heart rate and respiration and the coordination of the two. So I got really interested, started reading his research and, and connecting with him through email to learn more about that. And so that began my polyvagal journey, and I used that as the primary mode of how I treated babies in the NICU until I left there, and I sort of like didn't really pay much attention to it, and, and I was still treating babies as an occupational therapist in an outpatient setting, and at the time I didn't even have, um, that was the beginning of when I had a private practice. So I um, started seeing a lot of babies with head and neck turning problems and, and also feeding problems as well. And I started to pull that information back into my life and found out that it had applications to everything that I was seeing, um, not only as an occupational therapist but as a cranial sacral therapist. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to start out by just defining what the autonomic nervous system is because polyvagal theory is everything to do with autonomic nervous system regulation. And the term regulation means that you can control how things are going and your, in, your interactions with the environment. An older theory of the autonomic nervous system, which most of us probably learned in school, is that there's two divisions. And that's um, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And those two divisions stand for fight, flight, or flee, which are defensive mechanisms, and then rest and digest. Well, Dr. Porter thought that maybe that was a little bit, it didn't really encompass everything about how we interacted with the world. So he came up with um, a hierarchical response system and, and redefining the autonomic nervous system and actually turned it into, into three branches. One is the social branch, the sympathetic, and the parasympathetic. And he called it the polyvagal theory because it's a theory. It's just the way he could see that it was the autonomic nervous system was conceptualized. And what it basically states is that how we feel inside, our physiological state, how our body is feeling, is going to dictate not only how we behave, but the ranges in which we're able to behave, and also what our personal experience, so whether we're having fun, or we're joyful, or we're really fearful. So this is a, a lot of these diagrams that you're going to see today are um, original artwork that I've come up with. And these are not Dr. Porges' work, but I've, what I've come up with just to conceptualize and to help us understand, as practitioners who work with babies, how can we really put this into practice for us? So I mentioned that he broke it down into three divisions, really. The first one being, oops, the first one being social, the social nervous system, which we're going to talk a lot about in just a little bit. And within the social platform, this is, a, is a, the big word here is safety. When we're in social engagement, it's all about determining whether this is safe for us or not to interact. Because if you've got fight, fight, or flee, or the freeze response, those are both defensive mechanisms. So when the defenses are high, we're not feeling safe. When the defenses are low, we're feeling safe in here. And this is where we really get the juice of autonomic nervous system regulation. The second platform is sympathetic, and we've all learned about that as a fight or flight, but really what he's saying this is, is about mobilization. 
Okay, so fight, fight, and flee. It's, it's all about moving your body and getting going. The parasympathetic is immobilization, so the freeze response, which we're all really familiar with. And many of us um, are familiar with the parasympathetic because as body workers, I think some, I was taught early on that we want people to be in a parasympathetic state because that's all about rest and digest. But we're gonna learn a little bit more about that today, that maybe rest and digest is not everything about immobilization. So I'd like to explain just a little bit. It's just, this is the way I conceptualize it. This may or may not work for you. But it's, what he's saying is because of the hierarchy is that when we respond to a threat from the outside environment or actually from the inside of our environment, we'll always have a first response. And what he's saying with the polyvagal theory is that there's a, an evolved mammalian portion that is unique to mammals, not unique to humans, that where there's a myelinated portion of the vagus, and that's where the social piece came in, that we actually developed this, the ability to be social with one another. The arrows represent going up and down the platform, because when we first learned about the autonomic nervous system, maybe we learned that one was on and one was off. And it's sort of a balancing technique. And he, the polyvagal theory reframes that for us and shows us that it's actually about moving smoothly between all of these states. Because to be a healthy organism and to interact with the environment and our caregivers and have meaning in life and to have fun and to be able to play, we're going to be able to smoothly transition between here. So this arrow, the purple arrow that's on here, I'm calling the resiliency arrow because the arrow represents the ability to smoothly traverse the states between a social state, a mobilized state, and an immobilized state, and then back up again. Because all of those are gonna serve a purpose for us at some point. So what I mean by resiliency arrow is that we're gonna, we're gonna have, it's gonna have flow, we'll have smooth transitions between the states, there'll be an ease of movement and a full range of expression. And the term, I'm going to coin the term here right now of ANS resiliency. And what that means is that resiliency is that property about us that not only can we encounter maybe traumas in our life, but we can actually heal from them. And that's the point of the resiliency and the point of moving between the states is that we don't accumulate stress and tension in our body. That we can learn to discharge that and reactivate ourselves into meaningful states especially going back up into social engagement, which is the most healing. The unique thing about babies, especially in the fourth trimester of life, and that's the first 12 weeks, is that they've gone through a transition of in utero life where things were really fairly well regulated for them. Okay, even if things were not going so well, it's a fairly well regulated environment. So then they come out and they're very vulnerable because these are all new experiences. And the autonomic nervous system, although a very good system, can still have vulnerabilities <laughs> based on your experiences, based on your, your DNA sometimes, based on the pregnancy, based on things that happen. So babies experience challenges with this transition, and that is a normal <laughs> thing. We don't expect babies to come out and be well regulated. Most of us are really aware that babies need not only um, to be held and to be fed, but they need to be interacted with in order to feel like they can learn how to, to self-regulate. That's sort of a, a skill that babies learn over time. They come out and they need our help and then gradually with maturation and experiences and the ability to smoothly flow through all three of those states, they learn how to regulate themselves. What happens often is that they quickly, because we are so efficient as human beings and organisms, will quickly develop maladaptive and adaptive coping strategies to everything that happens. Okay? And, so, and then the brain learns, and then it wants to set down a really easy way of getting to that every time. So that's one thing that we see with babies, actually, either maladaptive or adaptive coping strategies. And things like social engagement and tummy time activities, and also our therapeutic presence can, and that's not only us, but the parents as well, can actually encourage this autonomic nervous system resiliency. This is another way of looking at the hierarchy and being able to appreciate why we want to be able to traverse all of these states and, and not have um, you know, a fear of we don't ever want to go to sympathetics because look what's in sympathetics here. These are scales underneath here of ranges of interactions that can happen with each one of these platforms. So within the social, which is all about safety, okay, this is 
for us in our world, that's what we're always trying to figure out. Everybody, all the rituals and the consistencies and the patterns and habits that we have are all to, to help us feel safe inside. So what you have to have for this to happen is it has to be, for social engagement, the very definition of this is it has to be bi-directional and it has to be reciprocal. So what does that mean exactly? That means that you have a baby and a parent or a, a baby and a, and a therapist and they're doing things together. And that's basically you know, the range of behaviors that happen here. Within the sympathetic, which is a mobilized state, we need to get there because guess what? Play is here. And tummy time. <laughs> that's my thing. That's like sort of like this end of it. And there's also this other end of it, which we do have access to fight, flight, flee, because we do need defensive strategies. We do need to let our parents know when we need a change. We do need to be able to cry and let the world know. So the ranges of behavior are all functional. We want to be able to run away if there's a dangerous situation. Within the parasympathetic, it's an immobilized state. You've got these wonderful aspects of it, of sleep, rest, snuggling, growing, um, prolonged immobilization without fear. For those of you who are familiar with the polyvagal theory, you may know that terminology. All the way to freeze and death feigning and dissociation. This is another way of looking at it, just depicted within pictures. So we have um, both this bi-directional thing happening with the face-to-face -face social engagement. Because one of the key aspects of working with the polyvagal system is not just that it's the vagus nerve, but it's the whole social engagement system, which is going to encompass four other cranial nerves, 5, 7, 9, 10, and 11. We're going to get into that in just a minute. But this is where we're feeling, you've got all this going on here where the baby's looking at you and they're animated and you can tell they're online. This is a very satisfying place for a baby to be. Within the mobilization context, you've got a baby here doing tummy time and having a great time and still you know, sort of having some aspects of social engagement maybe. And then all the way up to crying and, and having a problem. So what does determine the difference um, uh, in this range is basically this cocktail of stress hormones that's happening. Okay? So we do need a little bit of sympathetic drive in order to play and move and have a good time, but when it gets too much and overwhelming, this is when we tend to go tip over into this scale. But again, it's a functional place to be for communication. Within the mobilized state, here we got, you know, just hanging out together and this baby just hanging out on its mom's chest. Laying in is another term for that, all the way down to a dissociation in a baby. This is a social nervous system that's offline. So when we are in an immobilized state, we're not in social engagement. But we can have interaction and, and being together. So it's not like you're not in social engagement here. The difference between here is that when we can feel safe in an immobilized state, we've got a lot of oxytocin flowing here. In here, we do not. This is just another way of looking at it, because what I want to be able to provide for you is just ways and images to be able to look at this very easily. So really what we're saying is that there are three platforms in how we will meet anything that comes into us from the outside world. It's the social again, so this is a platform. Mobilization and mobilization. The beautiful thing about this platform is that what we can learn to do once we're moving up and down, up and down here, is that we can actually stack on top of this other more sophisticated behaviors. Okay? So you get experiences with social engagement and back and forth with your parent. You can actually learn. We can, we can build a huge cognitive capacity. And this is how we've done this. Be able to develop our brains into where we're, we actually are extremely intelligent. And we're stacking this on top of these abilities. Versus, you know, in mobilization, the same thing. We get good experiences with mobilization. Weaving in experiences of safety, we can build more elaborate movement strategies, more ability to change our posture against gravity, more ability to get into tummy time and enjoy ourselves, to be, enjoy being held and moving. Same thing with this. We can actually learn how to feel safe and be comfortable in an immobilized state and not to have that as a defensive mechanism. You see many of the babies are just squirmy and wormy and they're just moving around. Sometimes that's, a, that's the baby's efforts in order to get regulated so they, this state doesn't feel safe for them so they're trying to move up 
the ladder, so to speak, into mobilization. And then what we can do as therapists is help not only be able to interact with babies so that they can get a taste of that, be able to educate the parents on how to help them shift up into social engagement and really help them understand the implications of not doing this and helping them learn to traverse the states. So we're going to get into the good part of it now, the polyvagal treatment. This is basically um, the vagus nerve behind here. The vagus nerve has vast implications on our entire body system. It innervates all of our viscera, our throat, our larynx, and everything. Three ways to get in there are what we're going to call portals. So these are portals. These are ways to get into the vagus nerve. One portal is the face portal, one portal is the posture portal, and another one is the proprioceptive portal. Um, if many of you are familiar with Dr. Porges' work, you may be familiar with some of these words that he's used these. I've taken a little bit of liberty and added some um, additional ones like the proprioceptive and I'll explain that to you in a minute. This is what I call working under the hood. Because the vagus nerve is basically how we're functioning as, ba as babies, and we're going to learn how to get under the hood and really how to work with this. So through the first heart portal, I mean the, for the first portal, the face heart portal, all all of these aspects are, are in that category. So one way is through eye gaze. So making eye contact and eye gaze with the baby is a direct way of working on the vagus nerve. And when we're working with the vagus nerve, that's a way to help it learn to traverse those states, to be able to stay in social engagement and have a, because how the baby's feeling up here will have a direct feeling, direct response in how they're feeling down here in their gut. Another one is facial expressivity. So how much the baby's actually expressing with their face. Listening, um, because one of the, the responsibilities of um, the social engagement system is to be able to dampen down the background sound so that you can pay attention to the human voice. So both listening, so sometimes that's why we inherently will talk to babies or sing to babies, but also too talking and cooing back and forth. Because one of the indicators of the vagus nerve is vocal prosody. Is everybody familiar with that term? How clear and what a good quality your voice sounds like. So many of us know babies that have kind of squeaky cries or you know, like wah, wah. That's actually a direct reflection of the functioning of their vagus nerve in that moment. Okay, versus when a baby has a very bah, big robust cry. It's a wonderful thing to hear, a big robust cry, because you know that the vagus nerve is actually in a good regulated state. Another thing is through breathing. One of the best ways to access the myelinated portion of the vagus nerve, which is uniquely mammalian, is through exhaling. So you exhale a little bit longer than you inhale, and that automatically sl it puts on the vagal break, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and it slows our heart rate down lower than even a resting heart rate, which does what? It turns off our defensive mechanisms and turns on our social engagement system. Singing and humming. This is important because when we sing and hum, we create vibrations. And the vibrations from our larynx, which is directly innervated by our vagus nerve, actually goes up through the recurrent laryngeal nerves and kind of tells the vagus nerve everything's okay, which is why chanting and humming and singing actually are regulatory in nature. They can help us calm and they can help the baby calm as well. And I like to include breastfeeding with, with everything because it's obvious. The posture heart portal, we're going to include breathing here too, just because breathing has a lot to do with posture, but also our position in space and postural changes. And that includes movement and the effects of gravity and also swaying. So you can actually get in there under the hood and work with the vagus nerve and make it be more resilient and really give the baby access to all the vagus nerve has to offer them, which is the feelings of safety and security and the ability to traverse those three um, planes and autonomic states easily through movement. I mean, how we just naturally begin to move with babies. And that goes in and, and calms the vagus nerve down and helps it be regulated. The proprioceptive heart are things like skin to skin touching, massage, reflexology, tummy time, and breastfeeding. So these are three ways to sort of what I call work on under the hood. Because if you have something going on with your car and it, it's not running right and it's, it's kind of bumping down the road and you take it and the mechanic wants to work on the dent in the fender, you know, that's not going to be really, really helpful. So we're going to get underneath there so to speak, and really work on the engine of how babies are functioning. 
Gonna, the social nervous system encompasses the vagus nerve, but it also has these other nerves that are with it. Cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, 10, and 11. And those together encompass and make up the social engagement system. So the vagus nerve works very intimately with these, with these other nerves. And it works intimately with everything in the body, but specifically for social engagement, it's these five. The first one being the trigeminal, and that innervates a lot of our sucking muscles and jaw mobility, so it includes some of these muscles here. It has three major branches. It's tactile, proprioceptive, and pain receiving sensation from the face, the mouth, and nose, the sinuses, the dura, scalp, upper eyelid, and parts of the eye. But one of the things that the trigeminal nerve does is it helps to dampen those background sounds. Okay? The facial nerve is sensory from parts of the tongue, parts of the pharynx, and from the skin around the ears. And it's motor to all the muscles of facial expression. And for social engagement, the muscles of facial expression are of utmost importance. Plus, some hyoid elevation, which helps us with swallowing. And this stapedius muscle, which is the smallest skeletal muscle in the human body, is the one that has to tense actively in order to dampen down the background sounds, to extract the human voice from the, from the background sound. So this is some of the kids that you know they don't have hearing problems, but they're not listening. Right? Like, I know he can hear me, but why can't he hear me? Well, that's sometimes because they're in a state of dysregulation, okay, because that's sort of the definition of a child. They're going to go in and out of periods of dysregulation that they really can't hear. They really can't extract the human voice and make sense of it at that moment, okay? So what we would say to parents is work with social engagement. Get, make sure that all the social engagement system is online, the facial expressions, eye contact, that the breathing is relaxed and you're exhaling and before you can expect really a child to understand your voice. And that happens a lot to babies too, which um, I think is why the shh sometimes works. It also innervates the posterior belly of the digastric. And here is a representation. My daughter Marin did this. And it's not really coming across very clearly, but she really captured the striations of all the facial muscles. But th this is it. This is the, the facial nerve, basically, and how the face is functioning. One of the things that's really, I think, common to see in babies is facial asymmetries, especially around the mouth. And basically, that's just because babies are immature. This is, you know, some of their first experiences with some of this. But if you can think about um, how the proprioceptive heart portal is something you could work with, and a baby has a facial asymmetry, perhaps doing skin-to-skin -skin touching and massage in the direction that these muscles are could be helpful for getting that online. See how simple that is? The other one is the glossopharyngeal. And um, it innervates one of, there's only one muscle in the pharynx that isn't innervated by the vagus nerve, and it's taken care of by the glossopharyngeal nerve, which helps with elevation and swallowing. And that's one of the biggest troubles we see with babies in suck swallow breeds, just difficulty with the coordination of it or the actual action of it itself and then just some general sensory information. The vagus nerve, being uh, the 10th cranial nerve, is there's all these different names for it. The wanderer, the vagabond, the pneumogastric nerve, the external hypothalamus. Basically, lots of people throughout time have understood the importance of the vagus nerve. And we understand that when we understand that 80% of all of the sensory registration from below going up to the brain comes from the vagus nerve. It's very important. It's really our body scanner, the vagus nerve. It's looking out for all the dangers, not only in the external environment, but in the internal environment. But it also supplies some really important motor and parasympathetic information to all the viscera, except the adrenal glands, and to the skeletal muscles of the pharynx and larynx which is why vocal prosody is an issue when you hear a baby. Sometimes I call it the velociraptor cry. Sort of sounds like a baby dinosaur. That just lets you know that at that moment, that vagal tone is dysregulated. And vagal tone is just the measurement of how well regulated the vagus nerve is getting. And I know Janine's gonna get into a little bit of that, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with that. There are basically, you know, part of the polyvagal theory is that this ventral vagus, which is the myelinated portion, I mentioned that it was unique to, to mammals, acts as a vagal break. 
So when we are in social engagement or we're working in that social autonomic state, the vagus nerve acts as a break dampening down the heart rate. That is a very adaptive function because it allows us to turn off our defensive mechanisms and to engage with the world, which is what becomes meaningful for us. The dorsal vagus is more of the, um, the older portion of the vagus nerve. It also decreases heart rate, but it's very different because what it does is, this is where you hear people passing out from fear. It's because it, it just can't take it anymore and they just have to shut it out. When we see this happen in babies, it's like a premature baby when they get, they call it a bradycardia. That's what's happening with this because they're still immature and the, the myelinated portion of the vagus is, can be dysregulated and it's very vulnerable early on. Once you get some experiences in the extra year in life and you get through the fourth trimester, this works a little bit easier, but you're very vulnerable, especially as a premature infant. So this is a very different way of decreasing heart rate and this sort of like shuts it down and immobilizes you and pulls you out of social engagement and you're in, in a defensive mechanism. And this is where there's, there's a lot of fear associated here. Um, I'll entertain questions about that. We're gonna have questions at the end. I don't wanna spend too much time. And the last one is the accessory nerve. So we got the accessory nerve innervating both the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, which are, I want someone to yell this out please, indicated in what condition that we see so very much. Very good. All right, so knowing that now the accessory nerve is a highly intricate part of the social engagement system, can we see how torticollis and the resultant symptomatology of the flat skull is a social engagement problem? It's not a problem of muscles, it really isn't. You might have some, um, you know, from in utero restriction, you might have some set up for some vulnerability, but babies are highly equipped with postural reflexes and also brainstem reflexes, which make them able to actually turn their head to both sides, not only um, in response to their parents' voices, but also just to explore the environment because that's, you know, they're gonna have access. And guess what? Guess what is gonna happen if you don't ever get on your tummy or you do it very little? You're not gonna have access to all of your writing and, and reflexes because in order for us to have access to all of our writing, our postural and writing reflexes, we have to be belly down to the earth. We have to get the ventral surface down in order for that. And in a back to sleep society, it really is hard because we're sleeping on our backs and we're in car seats in our backs and we're held on our backs. And so many babies have these resultant issues with the sternocleidomastoid, so to speak, and the trapezius because they haven't been put in positions in which they can activate their own resources. So this is a diagram that shows you the social engagement system. I'm using the terms social engagement system and social nervous system interchangeably and I'd like to invite you to do that as well because they mean the same thing. But this is what all is included. So what I like to say is like see all these like little light switches, right? And they all need to be turned on. And babies actually deserve this. And you know, many parents are just, they, they, don't, they don't have the knowledge that this is what's actually happening. That we, what we want to do in the fourth trimester, and especially right after birth, is actually give the baby the best opportunity to engage in the world and to have meaning. So all of this needs to be turned on, right? Meaning that we need the middle ear muscles tensing actively in order to be able to hear the parent's voice. What's gonna help that? The parent's gonna be talking and cooing, they're gonna be practicing listening, and all of these things are gonna happen. We have the facial muscles and they have to be engaged. And also too, with facial muscles, I always look at symmetry. And not so that we have perfect symmetry, because none of us are, but that we have balance. Because sometimes you'll see a baby and you look at it, that's the first thing I always do is just like, what's going on with the facial muscles? Because that's gonna, I know for a fact that the facial muscles are gonna tell me what's going on behind the mask, okay? So if I see a baby, I will automatically sort of, you know, make a midline split here and it's just check it out and make sure that the muscles of facial expression are happening on both sides. And if they're not happening, whatever side they're not happening on, 
that side, you're going to have um, vestibular sensitivities and you're also going to have auditory sensitivities. And the reason for that is because everything sounds too loud because you cannot dampen it down. And an indicator of whether that middle ear muscle is working is whether the orbicularis oculi is really sort of squinting and is engaged. So that same side ear will not be able to do that. Uh, the trigeminal influence here is the sucking and jaw mobility. So we've got temporalis and masseter and really moving our jaw is a big part of our social engagement system and we see that um, in asymmetry here a lot of times and also babies with tongue tie and lip tie will have, um, they have midline restriction. So they usually if you have a midline restriction and you're a baby and you don't have, um, you know, you don't have midline control which doesn't happen until about three, sometimes four months, you're at, you're a bigger vulnerability because you're going to turn your head to one side and one side is actually going to activate more than the other one. Head turning and orienting, this is really important part of it because a baby, all babies should be able to, unless they have neurological damage, turn their head to both sides. So this is a bilateral thing. So you look at a baby and, and you see the baby can only, you know, they have a really strong head preference to the left the best thing you can do for their vagus nerve and to help them to, uh, to be more regulated and to be calm and safe and happy is to actually work to see if you can get the head and neck riding reflexes going on the opposite side. The eye gaze, eye closing, and eye crinkling, which I mentioned to you, is a part of the facial nerve. The laryngeal muscles for vocal prosody, also for swallowing. And the pharyngeal and tongue muscles, which also brings in somewhat the hypoglossal nerve, but one of the tongue muscles, the platoglossal, is innervated by the vagus nerve. And then that's it again. So when we're looking at babies, you can actually sort of overlay these little red circles the next time you see a baby and say, are all of these light switches turned on? And if not, helping them have access to this will give more regulation than anything else we can really do. Okay. This is an example of social engagement system being online. And this, there's nothing sweeter than this face right here. But do you see what's happening? We have eye gaze. We have muscles of facial expression. This looks relaxed. They're face to face. All the defensive mechanisms are turned off. There's a sense of safety. This is actually promoting this baby to have better autonomic nervous system regulation. This baby being, doing this with this grandfather will equip this baby to handle the next thing that comes in that's maybe seen as a threat. You know, they may need to move into a mobilized state. The ventral vagus is engaged, so their heart rates, this is a mutual benefit here. Both of their heart rates are lower than resting heart rate, which helps us feel really safe and connected. And it allows, again, those platforms to happen. Remember we were stacking higher level cognitive processes on top of social engagement? This allows this to happen. She gets to learn about what it's like to be in relationship. She gets to learn what it's like to be joyful in her body. And this will spill over into other circumstances that she faces. So I said it's mammalian, it's not uniquely human. So this is some examples of that. These guys are very social creatures, can you tell? They're just like locked in this like embrace and this little baby like, oh, me, me, me. <laughs> but this right here, it's like, you know, this sort of reminded me a little bit, one of the gorillas at the Cincinnati Zoo just had a baby, so I have like a million pictures of her breastfeeding, like ever the whole world is looking at her. This is not her actually, this is another one, but you know, sometimes, you know, we're like, look at me, you know, with the kids. That's not what's happening here. This is a loving embrace. Because one of the things about eye contact and we're working on social engagement and autonomic nervous system regulation is not that you demand it, it's that you entice it and that you engage it and that you use yourself in order to help them find themselves that way. I could stay on this slide for a while. <laughs> Okay, so the whole point of working with this is that we really do want to be in a sympathetic state sometimes. You know, like we're, we've been taught we want parasympathetic. And actually, I'd like to go on record to say that, you know, the last thing you want to do with someone that's in trauma is get them in a parasympathetic state. Um, you really want to help them understand movement with safety.
And so what that would mean is that um, engaging with someone socially, making eye contact, and measuring their level of ability to do that, and using your facial expression, your therapeutic presence, is actually what we should be doing, trying to get them more in a mobilized state with safety. So one of the biggest challenges, because I do the tummy time thing, is that you know babies hate it and they don't really like it. But what we found, this picture is a little bit dark, is that when we do have some support, when we do have social engagement, we can actually find ways to mobilize our body and feel really good about it. Okay? This is what promotes autonomic nervous system regulation. Being able to dip your toe into the waters of what does it feel like to mobilize my body and still feel okay with it. And dip in and out of social engagement and mobilization and weave those experiences promotes brain development and we talked a little bit yesterday about proprioception and what that is and it's about it's about where where my body is in space but it's actually actually how I feel too about everything so there's proprioception meaning that I can tell that I'm standing up because I've got pressure on the bottom of my feet and I'm and I'm working my posture against gravity but there's also this uh, interoception this information that's coming up from my vagus nerve letting me know how my gut feels letting me know how my heart feels this is where you learn modulation and regulation because it is sort of a maturational and an experiential process. So if a baby is born and they, you know, they don't really know how to do it themselves, they have to learn it, okay? It's a process. They're learning modulation and regulation. So that's our job is to be able to come in and show them how to do this. And we do that through creating a context of safety all the time. So blending and weaving social experiences with mobilization. These all come together, social mobilization. This is an example of a parasympathetic state in more of the dissociative kind. This is where the social nervous system is shut down and disengaged. And um, this is a state in which is not healing and restorative and it's actually hindering brain development. How we understand that it is hindering brain development is this flat affect. We don't have any facial tone. When we, when we notice that babies lose the muscle tone in their face, we know that the social ner nervous system is offline and that there's, there's something danger Will Robinson happening with the baby. This is another example. I was, my point here is that the baby's sort of looking off and not really trying to make eye contact, but there's also this other parasympathetic state where they're sort of looking at you, but do you see this dull look? And it's almost like they're looking through you or just past you. And even though it looks like there's some attempts here at facial expression, because one of the things about the muscles of facial expression when we're looking at babies is that well, I'll have to say it in a minute because the slide's not there, is that especially the upper half of the face is what we're looking for. We're looking at the upper half of the face to be really indicating because what can happen down here is um, you can still see, you know, kids can sometimes still smile because we're so socially programmed to kind of do that and imitate, but it's really the rhizorius muscle is just sort of pulling the muscles back and it's usually using tone, it's not really a smile. So down here is not a very good indication of whether the facial muscles are turned on, the upper half of the face is. This baby also, I know it's really kind of hard to tell from a still photo, it has a little bit of torticollis, if you might have noticed that. And so this baby's having difficulty turning their head to the other side, which for me is the biggest problem because they don't have access to that. And so there's something not right in the social nervous system itself. The thing about parasympathetic states is that it is helpful because it deters painful experiences. So whether that's the pain of having some soft tissue restriction in the base of the skull or something going on in the body, because we, we do know babies have been tucked up in the womb and physiological flexion for a long time and they are in the process of elongating their soft tissue contractures in a normal way. But sometimes babies can have painful experiences, whether it's trauma or even a, pain, a, a literal physical painful experience or the possibility of having a painful experience of not having the social nervous system engaged. Sometimes I think that with um, some modern 
parenting lifestyles and practices that we don't focus enough on that. And it's, this is one of the things, it's a painful experience not to have a lot of social engagement and back and forth. So talking about this concept of being safe with immobilization. So the term prolonged immobilization without fear means that you can learn how to get into a parasympathetic state and just hang out and just be safe where the oxytocin can flow because of all of these reasons. One of the best ways to work with a baby that has autonomic nervous system dysregulation, and these are babies who go straight to fight or flight, or they're not able to engage socially, or they, they can't really turn their head to one side, is that when you can work with this, so this is just a lot of naked time with baby, it actually resets the autonomic nervous system function. So what that means is that it can help promote healthy function. And this is a term of being with and not doing to, and there's always a mutual benefit. So there's also a term called neuroception, and Dr. Porges coined that term to, it's, to let us know how our, how our body is getting all of this information. So the concept of neuroception means that the, it's an unconsciously mediated process in which the baby is determining what's a threat and what's risk and what's safety. So all of these things are coming in, relationships and caregiving interactions, environmental demands, risks, threat, danger, their own physiology, the internal physiology, and also experiences of safety that they've had. And we all have this, this is something that we use throughout our lifespan, this concept of neuroception, because we're always scanning the environment for danger and risk and threat and safety at all times. And we're, as, as human organisms, we are trying to be in a safe platform all the time. So this is what normally happens. So the hierarchical structure of the polyvagal theory means that when a threat does come in, that we immediately, that our first response as mammals, as humans, is going to be to anything social. So all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off, we're gonna look at each other and try to check it out. Like we're gonna use our eye contact and our facial expressions and maybe our vocal prosody to let us know. Hey, and there's like, oh my God, the it's on fire. And then we're gonna start, then we're gonna go boom into sympathetic and we're gonna all run out of the room, okay? And then say the doors are trapped and we can't get out and we'll pass out before we die because, wow. Um, <laughs> that's so unfair. Um, so that will just happen. But we actually, these are, this is an adaptive process. I don't want anybody to be scared of this anymore. We need to be able to traverse this resiliency arrow. This is the whole thing about health. This is the whole thing about recovery. We cannot stop trauma from happening. Okay, many of us are to coin this term birth trauma. Let's heal birth trauma. Well, bullshit, guys. It has to happen all the time. It, you know, you can't just deal with one micro trauma that happened in the womb. This is a, an ever evolving process, and, and it, it's all about being able to traverse all of these states and understand the scales, remember again, that are underneath this. So, this is our first response, according to Dr. Porges' polyvagal theory, to anything is going to be social. And that's, that's the way it should be. Sometimes it happens that there's an interrupted social circuit here for whatever reason. There, you know, we didn't work with the facial nerves or we have, you know, all babies, by the way, are born with a head preference to one side. I just want to clear that up just really quickly and say that they'd never worked on that and, and this isn't working for them anymore. Well, sometimes babies will automatically get their first response to things will be fight or flight. So it's the baby, something comes in, and they're like, Wah! okay, they're not having a good time. But that means that there's something happening with, there's a social uh, engagement circuit interruption. And there's a whole litany of things that I could list what, of how, what happened to interrupt it. And then there's also the baby that will go, any threat that comes in, instead of responding in a social way, they go straight to parasympathetic. They just zone out, they just crash out, they just shut down. One of the things I want to show with this slide is just that this is right after birth. And, you know, although babies aren't cognitively smart, they're not really thinking rationally and they don't have, you know, language in English uh, and, and or whatever language they're born in, but they do come very equipped with the social engagement system, the ability to use eye contact and look at this, facial expression. This is fresh out of the womb, folks. And 
to be able to do this. They're bringing their hands close to either the mom or the face. And this is where we're going to get brain development and maximized. This is where we begin to set up that strategy of going to that social engagement first. This is all about connection and attachment. It builds resiliency. This helps us get over the things that come in that are threats or traumas so that we can be resilient about that. It's pleasing to both the baby and the caregiver. And safety is permeating everything that's happening here. All the defenses are turned off. Now, if this baby needs to move into a mobilized state, that might be able to happen easily. Here's my slide. Uh, this is about the facial expressivity and the, especially the upper portion of the face. And I'm not devaluing what's happening down here. This is good stuff too. But when you are trying to evaluate the, uh, the abilities of the social engagement system, to really pay attention to that upper half. See this happening here? And this baby's like, what? or whatever. Again, here are the portals. So we're working with the vagus nerve because the vagus nerve is, is uh, very resilient and has a lot of impact for us. But babies, by the very nature, are immature and they're coming out and they're learning these experiences. This is how to sort of work under the hood. Thinking about engaging through these portals to directly treat the vagus nerve through eye, facial expression, listening, talking, cooing, exhaling longer than you inhale, breastfeeding, um, swaying and movement. Everybody knows babies will really love movement, right? That's one of the things that um, comes naturally to people. And then also, too, making sure they're getting enough skin to skin. A big piece of autonomic nervous system regulation, and what I'd like to pass on to you guys, is that our therapeutic presence is actually a big component of the treatment. And this is sort of a, a metaphorical, metaphysical way of working with the autonomic nervous system. We have cranial sacral therapy and other hands-on sort of therapies. But this, I believe, is way more powerful in that we are aware of our own heart rate, our own respiratory rate, and then we have a sense of internal calm when we're interacting with babies and their families. And that's the most important part of it because we're obviously seeing babies that are having troubles most of the time. I mean, I see babies just for, for preventative. I had a mom bring a baby here and she's like, oh, there's nothing going on with him. We just didn't think it was fair that his brother got cranial sickle therapy and this baby didn't. And actually we found a torticollis she didn't know about, but that's okay. But the biggest thing is that you exude safety. I love the word exude. Someone used it yesterday and I was like, oh, that's so awesome. But that we're exuding safety. Okay, and so one of the things we're doing when we're trying to process what lesion they have, okay, is we're knitting our, you know, we're trying to figure it out. We're in our cognitive mind, which is where we really need to be is in our therapeutic presence. And that, my friends, is going to be, have a bigger impact than anything you do with your hands. So how do you do this? Well, um, you have to learn how to be immobilized without fear. And so many of us have a problem with this. You see me dancing up here. I dance all the time. I move a lot. But I'm using postural movement and swaying to calm myself. And, and I can do that too when I'm treating. If, I need, if I'm aware of that for myself and I'm talking to a parent, it's okay if I shift my weight back and forth, right? Because I'm keeping myself regulated. I'm exhaling longer than I'm inhaling. But to hold the therapeutic presence and maintain internal calm, exuding safety, lower heart rate, and lower respiration when this is happening is the key because that's what's going to bring this baby out of this and be able to hold this presence with this baby crying and also be able to hold the presence between the mom and the baby. Very briefly, I'm going to take two minutes and I'm going to take questions because that's probably the juiciest part of it. This is Elliot's story. She was born, beautiful, healthy baby. Um, some things happened and at six weeks she looked like this. And so many of you can understand that. We're not even going to talk about that right now. But that is a postural thing, so we know that there's something going on with social engagement because there's not a, a balanced sort of uh, engagement here. She had a lot of uh, dysregulation. She had a lip tongue and tie tongue, tongue tie that was finally discovered. She went through multiple, you know, she lost a lot of weight, you guys, in um, a really dangerous situation. And um, you can see this in her face. And here she was. She got an NG tube at 11 weeks. We started to do a lot of the polyvagal work because that's basically what I do now is just to tell parents about polyvagal theory and how to interact with their babies because they're way more competent in, in helping their babies than I am. 
Well, I noticed some things as she was starting to get a little bit better. You start to see more, you know, positive muscles of facial expression, but you see she, she has some issues going on in a small jaw. We did a lot of face, heart, portal stuff, a lot of baby wearing, a massage, craniosacral therapy. She started gaining weight. Her latch was improving. Mom's in less pain. This is at 25 weeks. You could still see she has a tiny bit still of this little postural thing left, and it's getting, you know, it's just intermittent, though. You know, this was taken just a second later. She still has, like, what I call roller coaster latching like your mom's like it's good it's bad it's good it's bad and um, so we just sort of dealt with that as we went on and now we're seeing a lot more balanced uh, postural system and she's doing a lot more with her face and engaging and this is her currently this is what we're talking about folks is really making this really strong powerful warrior of movement and enjoying their body this is also, too, working with the polyvagal system. These are precursors to empathy because a lot of us know that the polyvagal theory is all about, too, how love, how we share love. And um, even though babies, uh, you know, this is what we call precursor skills to empathy because you can't truly have empathy until you realize there's an other, and these guys think we're all the same. <laughs> So what I just want to end with is that play is a neural exercise. So as you're working with these things, the social engagement, this is actually neural exercises in order to help the vagus nerve and also to promote autonomic nervous system regulation. So at this point, I'm going to take questions. Do we have a microphone, please? Thank you. Hi. I am wondering, so for those babies that you see that don't like tummy time, uh -huh. is that usually an indicator of a lack of regulation of the vagus nerve? Yeah, it's, it can show many different things. There's Again, there's always going to be a list. There's never one answer to everything. It could be that they're not able to move into sympathetic, mobilized states with that context of safety, okay? So that could be one thing. Maybe they're not getting enough social engagement because remember, weaving those experiences of social engagement with mobilization is what reassures the baby that this is okay. So sometimes it's that the tummy time experience has been done too fast, too quick, too sharp, too whatever, which is why I developed the tummy time program is like sort of like a package deal to understand how to do that in order to help babies like it because they do always like it, maybe only for five seconds, but they do find a way to like it. Another reason though why babies um, don't like tummy time is because why, when everyone just shouted out, they have torticollis and plagiocephaly. So if you have torticollis or plagiocephaly, which uh, I think we saw 60 some babies in the clinic the other day, and I would say that probably 80% of them had some sort of element of torticollis and plagiocephaly. So that's a lot of times why babies don't like it, because they have uh, restrictions. Good question, thank you. Michelle, I'm wondering about swaddling and how parents really seem to feel that that's what's calming their baby. And I'm thinking more they're going into deregulation. Is that? Okay, so the question was swaddling and parents wondering if swaddling is calming and you're wondering if that's really dysregulation. Well, um, remember the portals that um, there's a proprioceptive heart portal and one of the things that swaddling provides is proprioception because proprioception is really about our ability to detect pressure. So actually swaddling can be very calming. One of the problems that I have with swaddling, besides we won't even talk about hips and things like that, is that they use that in lieu of engaging the social, the, the facial muscles and the eye gaze. So it's used a little bit too much sometimes without, you know, the face heart portal is really the most important portal. But there is an avenue because some babies, they get really overstimulated and they can only tolerate really short, brief contacts of social engagement with the face. So you would use a little bit more proprioception. So I do use swaddling prescriptively and it's for babies, you know, we say this is another way to calm them and then when they get in this calm state, then you can engage the facial nerves, you know, and everything like that. Does that make sense, Teresa? Yeah. So swaddling is not bad or good, right? Mm -hmm. It's the abuse of it. Yeah, it's, it's using it for, I mean, and, and parents need to sleep. I get this, you know, it's, it's important. And it's important for parents' peace of mind, for the baby to be calm. And, but, and it is a way, but just to be able to educate parents that this is a way to help baby calm, and then this also is another way. 
when you explain it to them like that, they start using it more judiciously, I find, in my practice. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Yeah, um, what is your opinion about helmets and radio assembly? That's a great question, and Carol and Allison and I are going to talk on Saturday about torticollis and plagiocephaly, and you're going to hear a lot about it. Yeah, and that is actually like the polyvagal theory, torticollis, plagiocephaly, and tummy time are the things I love to talk about most. So we will we will get we'll that. We'll dive in. Okay, I had, you. I had three questions. So strike that. Second okay. one, um, just as a physiological explanation, not a psychological explanation. I'm curious. You had said how social engagement helps with the sympathetic fight or flight, if you're gonna go there. Um, could you physiologically explain how that occurs when there's that mutual benefit physiologically? Why does that also benefit the sympathetic response? Is my, did I not understand what you said? Well, I was talking about the social platform being mutually beneficial. Is the grandpa slide. Yeah, the yeah. grandpa slide is mutually beneficial being in here. Weaving in context of social engagement here is to help the baby learn how to handle sympathetic responses without getting into too much cocktail of stress hormones. So that part is all about the baby. I can talk to you after, I'm not totally okay. clear, but that's fine. I want to be clear though, does anybody else have a question related to what she's asking? Just by um, uh, happenstance that have visibility to drugs and alcohol in the womb. And so um, I see one specific child that has uh, dissociation uh -huh. and immobilization and mm -hmm. she, she's mostly she just stares out. So that's the last one. If you're trying to work with her to get her to, um, you know, have more vagal nerve interactions. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, she can't even really crawl, she, mm -hmm. and she's almost a year old. Mm -hmm. So she's kind of wiggling on the floor. She has no, so what would be the treatment for that? Because it's, there's, a, there's just like a whole range of things. Right. And that's a state that you don't want to be in. So she, that means she's not feeling safe, as well as maybe there's some brain damage or something. Mm -hmm. So there's possibly some brain stuff going on. Um, well, if you, that's one of the things I do too, is when a parent brings the, their child into their office, I will automatically assess what state we're all in. Because <laughs> you can see that very easily. Are, is the mom and baby, are they in social engagement? Because sometimes the babies come in and they're like, Who, whose office is am I in, you know? And other babies are just like in their car seat, sort of like staring off. I'll automatically assess what, what autonomic state I think the baby's in and also to what state I think mom's in. So if you find a baby is in an immobilized state a lot, the way to work back up to social engagement is to engage movement. So as the baby's on the floor, just rolling around, moving around, you're just going to get bits and pieces of the social, whatever you can get, two seconds of eye contact, one second of, of a little bit. You know, we, we use our own face to try to get that to happen so, because they'll mirror that a little bit. You, you raise up your eyebrows. Just try to get little, little bits of the face, you know, the face online. Another good one would be just infant massage, and that's why that's so powerful because that promotes, you know, you're going to have every aspect of it in there. You got the mom or the dad or whoever's going to do it or you, and, you know, giving a little bit of this or being available for it, not demanding it, but being available for it and then helping them with sympathetics. So that's another way to get that baby to move up. So I would work, try to work mobilization with safety and just get little bits at a time. And that's how it actually builds autonomic nervous system resiliency because then you teach her how to get up here. This has not been you know, either she has an interrupted circuit from a neurological damage or something else, I don't know, or both, but how to get up here and how to traverse that. And you can actually, in my opinion, heal brain damage that way because the autonomic nervous system is basically, that is the substrate of all of our health, how we feel in our autonomic nervous system from our viscera and our body and looking at the threat and safety in the outside world is how we're going to be able to engage, you know, in our life. So helping her traverse up and down. It's just to notice, really. You know, so this baby spends a lot of time in mobilized states. This would be a baby I would teach baby massage to because all those elements of the parent connection piece and moving and timing it with the baby's abilities. Great question, Lisa. Thank you. Could you speak a bit more about how you teach parents about the polyvagal approach or what they can be doing on their own? I find often parents are very tired and the intake of new information is, is difficult. 
Yeah, so I will always tailor it to the family and what I think they can do. But generically speaking, I would say something along the lines of, you know, babies have been, everything was basically taking care of them while they were in your womb. And now that they're coming out, they're starting to learn how to take care of things by themselves and how to handle their ability to come in and out of movement. So I would say, um, you know, I would talk about uh, one of the most powerful ways that you can help your baby settle is to learn how to make eye contact and do facial expressions and do face-to-face -face time. I mean, it's that simple. That's how, that's how babies are powered really um, by biological drives and reflexes, too. And I say, your baby has all of these abilities. We're just going to try to uncover them. And when your baby has the ability to engage with you socially and, and to do back and forth, that's going to be what's going to be helpful. And it just seems like it comes out really easily. And it almost takes away all of the stress of all the other things the parent's trying to do if they're just going to focus on, you know, getting the baby's social engagement system online. And it's sort of like de-stressing and making it be like, oh, this is so easy. And the way you tell it is you just show it. I don't have to say much. Sometimes I'll say, see this? or come over and try, or, you know, we, it's an experiential thing. Instead of trying to explain it with words, many times it just happens right in front because I'm modeling it. And so I say, this is what's going to be healing. This is what's going to be able to help your baby learn how to do this easier on, by themselves. Um, is there like a window of time? Uh, is it get, does it get harder, you know, to, to start moving across those, that ladder the more you wait? Yeah, good question. Yeah. So what she asks is, is it harder with time? Well, first of all, we can all work on this, you know, um, and, you know, throughout the lifespan. And we can, just like with Wendy's talk yesterday, we can all kind of relate to that, not only to the babies that we treat, but in our own lives. So it's throughout the lifespan, but it is true that our nervous system is very quickly trying to get these strategies under belt because we're trying to build higher level processes on top of it. You know, you got to be crawling and sitting and walking and, and eating and doing lots of other things. So the more maladaptive strategies that are um, picked up along the way, sometimes working through those takes more time, but it can always be done. Because this is, this is a autism here, guys. This is you know, where we're at with the social nervous system being offline and um, you know, really needing to, to really work on that because of something that may be going on organically or whatever, because we don't know really the cause of the differences in social engagement, but there, and there's a whole bunch of them. But um, you know, what we're saying about you know, developing maladaptive strategies is that everything can be corrected. That's the thing about autonomic nervous system resiliency. That's what I'm trying to say here, that we can work with this you know, throughout the lifespan. But sometimes, you know, if you get a baby that's eight or nine months old and they have this, you know, interrupted social circuit and they're going straight to, you know, getting upset every single time, that might be a little bit harder to work through or take a little bit longer. But actually, if, if there's a consistent uh, interaction, it, it will change. Any other questions? Thanks for doing this. This is actually um, this is actually a talk that I'd like to gi give over two days. This is like turned into a two-day class. So presenting this in a succinct way is very difficult in a short time period. So what I want to do is take what you get from it and come and talk to me at the break, or we can talk about it at another time. And I'm, I'm available to you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you.